So good morning everyone, how are we? So today I'm going to tell you all about the man that many people, including Sir Richard Branson, uh, the board and the members of the International Explorers Club and many others, currently holds the title as the world's greatest living adventurer. So the other day you were given some homework to do, you had to try and work out who this was. Hands up those people who didn't do their homework. Wow, a forest of hands, isn't it? Well, I didn't want to do this, but you've brought it upon yourselves. You've got no one to blame but yourselves, but I'm cancelling all shore leave for tonight. <laughs> You're all confined to the ship. And if you don't take this seriously, I'll cancel it for the full week, okay? So, so those who did do their homework, what did you come up with? Who did you come up with? David Attenborough. David Attenborough, world's greatest presenter, no doubt about it, but probably not an, an adventurer as such. So Ranulf Fiennes, yes, most certainly... Six or seven years ago, he held the title of the world's greatest living adventurer, but he hasn't done much since then, so I think he's been surpassed, but you make up your mind as, as we go through this. Anyone else? Bear Grylls? No, well, yeah. Uh, anyone else? Richard Branson? No, I don't think he'd uh, claim the title at the moment. Has anyone, hands up if anyone has ever heard of a 68-year-old Russian Orthodox priest, artist, and conservationist by the name of Fedor Konyakov? No one. Okay, that's great. That means that everyone today is going to learn something, which is good. And I must say that I was blissfully unaware of the existence of Mr. Konyakov until late May in 2014. And at the time, I was working for the Sunshine Coast Council, which is a local government authority about halfway up the Australian east coast. And um, it's a bit like a county, I suppose. And my role within the council was I was to grow the economy through tourism and sport. We had other people who were going to grow the economy through agriculture and, and aviation and health and other things. But I had the fun, sexy portfolio of tourism and sport. And I went to work one Monday morning, as I said, in late May 2014, just a normal day. Um, went to a staff meeting, answered a few emails, made a few phone calls. And around about mid-morning, I went and made myself a cup of coffee. And on the way back to my office, I grabbed the local newspaper. And I was looking through the newspaper. And on page four of the paper was a story about this Russian explorer who was attempting to become the very first person to row all the way across the Pacific Ocean, the world's largest ocean. And if he was to succeed, he would become, uh, it would be the uh, longest solo man-powered voyage in history. So, in history. And um, the, the article went on to say that he was trying to make for our local beach, Malulabar Beach, and that he expected to arrive somewhere within the next week. And I was surprised, and I was a little bit embarrassed because... I thought that I had contacts everywhere, and I had my finger on the pulse of everything that was going on on the coast. But this is the first time I'd heard about this. And just then the phone rang, and it was the CEO of the council, who was several heads on the totem power of power above me. And uh, he said, Did, have you seen this story about the Russian rower? And I said, yeah, I was just reading it now. And he said, OK, well, I want you to handle it. And I said, handle it. And his exact words were, I want you to do whatever it is that you do. And at the time, I had this reputation of being able to create an opportunity or develop an opportunity or see an opportunity and, and leverage it, make it much bigger and more successful than it otherwise would be. And that's what he wanted me to do. And I thought, well, this is great. This would be a fun little project to play with. So the first thing I did is I rang the journalist who had written the story. Now, I knew him quite well. And I said, where did you get this story from? And he said that Oskar Konyakov, the, um, the son of the rower, had uh, arrived on the Sunshine Coast a few days before with a support group that were going, and he was waiting for his father to arrive. And that Oskar had rung the paper and given them the story. And it's the first time the journalist had heard about it, and he, was, uh, he said, isn't it a great story? And he said, um, Jeff, I was actually going to give you a call because Oskar needs help, and I thought you'd be the best person to help him. So he gave me Oscar's contact details, and for the very first time, I rang Oscar Konyakov um, to have a chat. And he's a lovely guy. He speaks English very, very well. And um, he was very happy to hear from me. I mean, 
We have three levels of government in Australia, which is at least one too many, um, and we have federal, state, and local. And he didn't know uh, who to ring in which department of which level of government. So he was very happy to hear from someone saying that they were offering some help. So I said to him, you know, where are you staying? And he said, Malula Bar. And I said, well, do you know where the yacht club is at Malula Bar? And he said, but of course, because Russians don't say yes, they say, but of course. And um, I said, well, how about I meet you down there in half an hour and we can have a talk about this. And so I did a few more things around the office and jumped in the car and went down and met Oskar Konyakov for the very first time. And it turns out that he looks remarkably like the Scottish-born Hollywood action hero Gerard Butler. And the reason I know this, and the person who pointed it out to me, is none other than Terry Irwin from Australia Zoo. Does anyone know Terry Irwin, the, the wife, the widow of the crocodile hunter Steve Irwin? Well, to tell this story, I've got to fast forward 12 months. So instead of being May 2014, it's now May 2015. And Fedor and Oscar, we're going to be back on the Sunshine Coast to unveil a plaque commemorating his achievement. And I'd been having lunch with Terry a few days before this was due to happen, telling her about uh, some of the conservation work that, that um, Fedor does. And I mean, Terry, I mean, I've got so much respect for Terry. She's a, a great businesswoman, she's a wonderful mother, and she lives and breathes conservation 24 7. So she was very interested in the conservation work that Fedor does. And she said, you know, is it possible to meet him, set up a meeting so I could uh, have a talk to him and maybe we can work on some projects together. So the meeting was set up once again back at the Yacht Club at Malula Bar. And it was a beautiful day and I was sitting out on the back deck with, um, of the Yacht Club overlooking the, the yachts in the marina. And uh, I had Fedor and Oscar and Oscar's family there. And I looked up and saw Terry striding through the Yacht Club. She always walks with a, a lot of purpose. And uh, she had her daughter Bindi with her as well. And she came out, she waved, and then she walked down, and she got within about three metres of us, and she stopped. And she threw up her arms, and she said, what are you doing here? And she rushed down, and she grabbed Oscar Konnikov and started hugging him. And I'm standing there thinking, what's going on? And I could see Oscar's face over Terry's shoulder as he was having the life squeezed out of him. And he was obviously thinking, what's going on? And I looked over at Oscar's wife. And she was thinking, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and uh, it turns out that Terry had met um, Oscar Konyakov, uh, oh, sorry, he'd, she'd met um, Gerard Butler a few months before and his wife uh, in Hollywood while she was there. And they got on very well. And she thought this was Gerard Butler, or Jerry Butler, as she uh, called him. And she couldn't understand why he was talking to her in a Russian accent rather <laughs> than a Scottish accent. And Confusion reigned supreme. I mean, I love Terry, but she'll be the first to admit that she hasn't got the greatest sense of humour in the world, and uh, she wasn't happy. She thought this was a setup, and that, that was a, she was the victim of a hidden camera show. And she wasn't happy, and because I'd set the meeting up, she wasn't happy with me, and trust me, that's not a place you want to be. And um, so confusion reigned for a couple of minutes. I was trying to explain to her that this was Oscar Kondyakov. She'd have nothing to do with that. She was hunting around, like Steve used to do, looking for hidden cameras. And um, she eventually pulled out her phone and she showed me photos of her with Jerry Butler. And I looked at these photos and looked at Oscar and thought, it is him. And so I started looking around for hidden cameras as well. But um, in the end, I said to Bindi, she had her phone there, and I said, can you Google um, Oscar Konyakov? And when some photos came up of Oscar, we all, it all became clear what had happened. And we had a really good meeting. And uh, they have worked together on some projects, conservation projects, uh, since then. And uh, Fedora is actually an Australia Zoo international ambassador now, which is great. But um, getting back to that first meeting back in uh, 2014 with that first meeting, Oscar said he needed a, a bit of help. And the main thing was that he was concerned that his father would be rowing across the very busy shipping lanes off the coast. And this was only a nine metre boat, very low profile very hard for a ship to see. So he said, you know, is there a boat that could go out and escort him across the shipping lanes? And I said, yep, no worries. I know the, the Commodore of the local uh, volunteer Coast Guard. They've got a 60-foot, uh, brand new 60-foot um, boat, bright yellow. They'd love to play with it. They'd love to do this. So that was all sorted. And the other main problem he had was that he said, if anyone actually touches the boat before it reaches shore, 
it could put the whole record in jeopardy. So no problem. What we'll do is I'll ring the, um, the local surf life-saving clubs and get some of the uh, inflatable rescue boats, the IRBs or the rubber duckies, um, and if we necessary, we can surround the boat to keep people away from it. So that was all sorted. And then he surprised me. He said that because of his father's status in Russia, because of the other adventures that he'd done in the past, his father was considered a national hero in, in Russia. In fact, he has the status of living national treasure. And because of that, uh, there was Russian news crews on the coast uh, ready to report his arrival. And the Russian ambassador to Australia was going to be flying in on Thursday. And he was, had a personal handwritten letter of congratulation from President Vladimir Putin to read out when uh, Fedora arrived. And so I thought, wow, OK, this is a bit bigger than I thought it was. Um, First of all, I'd never considered for a second that this guy might have done something else before that. So I thought, well, when I get back to the office, I'll have to do some more research into this, this gentleman. And the other thing was the Russian ambassador. I mean, the Sunshine Coast is, is a beautiful place. This is Malulabar Beach, where um, he was going to row, uh, aim to row to. And uh, it's a beautiful laid-back sort of place. It's not glitzy and busy like the Gold Coast, which is two hours south. And we don't usually get VIP visitors, high-profile visitors to the coast, uh, especially from uh, powerful countries like Russia. So I knew I was going to have to put some protocols into place and inform some, some people that this was going on. So I was getting it to be a little bit bigger project uh, already, which was, which was fine. But um, one thing confused me. Now, as I said, the Sunshine Coast is a beautiful place. But if I was going to be the very first person to row all the way across the Pacific Ocean, I'd want to make a big deal of it. I'd be rowing into Sydney Harbour and pulling up on the steps of the Opera House and saying, well, here I am. Or I'd row to Byron Bay, the easternmost point of Australia, to save myself a few hundred miles of, of rowing. Why would you come to the Sunshine Coast? And it turns out that there was really two reasons. Um, the first one was that um, they checked the currents, the famous Humboldt current that comes from South America across the Pacific, which ends fairly close to the Sunshine Coast. But the main reason was that this boat was this carbon fibre, state-of-the-art boat uh, with uh, state-of-the-art navigational equipment, satellite navigational and communications equipment. It was being built in England. And they had a deal with the boat builder. And that if this crazy Russian actually made it to Australia, the boat would be shipped back to England and the boat builder could use it for several months to promote at boat shows and trade shows and things to promote his expertise and to promote his business. And the boat builder had a brother living on the Sunshine Coast. And he said to this, his brother, if the Russian actually makes it, are you able to help out with the logistics of getting the boat back to England? And the brother, being a lazy bugger, said, that's fine, but um, it would be better for me if he came to the Sunshine Coast. So Fedora and Oscar and the boat builder looked over charts and things, and they decided, yeah, we can do that. We'll go to the Sunshine Coast. So, that's how it all happened. That's how I became involved. So it's really a lot of sliding doors happening at the moment. And um, so we decided to, for Oscar and I just said we'd keep in touch and that later on during the week we'd do some media together. And I went back to the office and Google is your friend. So I thought, okay, well, who is this guy? And Fedor, uh, Fedor Konyakov was born on the 12th of December, 1951. So he turned 68 a couple of months ago on the Sea of Azov, which is part of the Black Sea. His father was a fisherman, and at the age of 15, young Fedor borrowed one of his father's rowboats, and he rowed all the way across the Black Sea. At the age of 18, he was conscripted into the Soviet Navy, and after his initial uh, training, he was selected for Special Forces training. And he was part of a team that uh, smuggled munitions, so arms and ammunition, down from Russia along that, co that Asian coastline, through the American blockade to North Vietnam to supply arms to the North Vietnamese during that, that uh, Vietnamese war. But when his conscription period was over, he was so traumatized and disillusioned by what he'd seen during the war that he went a complete 180 from being in the, in the service. He enrolled in art school and wanted to become an artist. But in the, um, in the summer months of um, 77, 78 and 79, he went on a 12,000-mile voyage, reenacting the, the voyage of the great Russian uh, Admiral Vitus Bering, who was the man that discovered Alaska. And he got a bit of an uh, exploring bug at this stage. 
1983, he rafted down the Lena River in Siberia. Now, he applied to go on this, uh, this expedition, but was rejected. And then at the last minute, the 11th hour, someone dropped out and he was able to go on the expedition. Now, I've never been to Siberia, but I've been told it can get a little bit chilly. And this was three months on an open raft, so sleeping on the raft or sleeping in a tent along the river. And this was to study the habitat and what was impacting the Siberian tiger. And since then, well, Fedor is now considered to be the world's foremost expert in the conservation of Siberian tigers. Then two years later, he was part of another expedition across that far east of Russia, once again to study the Siberian uh, tiger population. And this expedition was another three months on foot, on horseback, and also rafting down the river as well. Then the following year, he went on a ski expedition to the Pole of Inaccessibility. Now, I'd better explain the Pole of Inaccessibility. This is a geographical location uh, located somewhere in the world, and it changes all the time. So in the northern winter, it is on the uh, ice flow in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, now, you can only get to that Pole of Inaccessibility in the, the dead of winter. So this was a, a team expedition that covered 700 kilometres. It was, if you ever talk to Fedor and you say to him, you know, which one wouldn't you want to do again? This is the one that he wouldn't want to do. He loves all his, his adventures, but this is the one he would pick that he wouldn't want to do again. It was 700 kilometres over the ice. It was minus 40 degrees most of the time. If any skin was exposed, it would be instantly frostbitten. Um, they had to haul uh, their sleds over the ice themselves. They came to fissures in the ice. They had to ca uh, haul them over those things. There was a lot of dissent in the party where some people wanted, thought this is too hard and they wanted to turn back, but people like Fedor wanted to keep on going on. Um, and they also had to be very aware of not, trying to, not disturbing polar bears who were in their hibernation period because that would have been very dangerous to them. But they eventually made it, but as I said, he wouldn't want to repeat this one again. And he's also, last year, went to the pole of inaccessibility in the southern hemisphere, but we'll cover that a little bit later on. In 88, he was part of a Russian-Canadian ski team to ski to the North Pole. And then the following year, he did another unsupported uh, trek, a walk to the North Pole, 63 days. That same year, he was leader of a Russian-American bicycle crossing of, uh, of Russia. Now, keep your eye on how many different disciplines we're talking about here. And this was at the time where Russia and the United States were at each other's throats. Um, and so this, this trek was designed to cross, create a friendship between the two countries, which is a, a lovely, noble gesture. I just don't know how friendly I would be after 131 days sitting on a bicycle seat. The next year, he did his first solo ski to the North Pole, which took 72 days. And then the same year, he was the first Russian to complete a solo, non-stop circumnavigation of the world in a yacht, which took him 224 days. But wait, as we say in Australia, there's more. In 1991, he was part of a Russian-Australian 4x4 crossing of, um, of the Soviet Union, which isn't quite how it happened. This was a part of a, a 60 Minutes television story. Uh, and when they started off, they started in the Soviet Union, um, but the Soviet Union broke up as they were on this journey. And so they finished in the Russian Federation. The next year, he did his first successful summiting of Mount Everest. A couple of years later, he was captain of a round-the-world yacht race, um, which took 508 days. And then he did another solo, unsupported walk to the South Pole which took 64 days. By 1997, he had achieved the Seven Summits Challenge. So that's to, um, to summit the highest peak on every continent in the world. Uh, in 88, 89, sorry, in 98, 99, he was part of an international solo around the world yacht race, so 27,000 nautical miles. And then he competed in the Iditarod race, the famous race in Alaska, the, the dog sled race. Now, because the other, the one before that had uh, finished quite late, uh, he had to borrow a dog sled team. Uh, he had no experience with dog sled teams, so he actually finished last in the Iditarod. Took him 15 days, where other people took less than seven days. But um, he kept on persevering. Other people dropped, off, dropped out in front of him, but he ended up winning an award for the most persistent racer after that, uh, after that event. 
And then in uh, 2000, 2001, he did another solo, non-stop uh, voyage around the world in a yacht. And then in 2002, he took a caravan, uh, sorry, a, a camel caravan, and he uh, went along the Great Silk Road, including crossing the Danakil Desert solo, um, which took 69 days. And then he rode across the Atlantic, setting a new world record for that event, 46 days and four hours. And then in 2003, along with uh, the Great Britain, Tony Bullimore, he set uh, three new world records for speed records in uh, multi-hull racing yachts. But wait, there's more. <laughs> in 2004, he did his fourth solo, circumnavigation of the world, and then he became the very first person to sail the Antarctica Cup, and he's still the only person to complete a solo, non-stop circumnavigation of Antarctica. Now, we don't really know a lot about Antarctica. We don't really know how big it is. So this is a map of the US, which is about the same size as Australia, superimposed on the continent of Antarctica. Now, around that continent, you've also got a lot of ice around that, and then around that, you've also got the fiercest oceans in the world. So as I said, the only person who has ever achieved a solo, non-stop circumnavigation, which took uh, 15,000 nautical miles. During all this time, he did his, his studies and his exams, and in 2010, he was ordained as a Russian Orthodox priest. He takes that very, very seriously. And then in 2012, he summited Mount Everest for the second time. And then he did another dog sled expedition from the geographical North Pole to Canada in 2013. Um, he is only the third person to achieve the Explorer's Grand Slam, which is to summit the highest peak on every continent and to walk to the North Pole and to walk to the South Pole. Um, he is the only person who has ever, ever lived on this planet who has achieved the, um, the five extreme, who reached the five extreme poles, which is the North Pole, which he's done several times, the South Pole, the, um, the top of Mount Everest, which is considered to be the Mountaineers Pole, the Pole of Inaccessibility, and he's done two of them now, and um, Cape Horn, solo around Cape Horn, which is considered to be the, uh, the Yachtsman's Pole. Now, all that's pretty impressive, and, you know, there's a... But, I mean, you're a pretty tough audience. There's a few dates in there with gaps in there, I can see you thinking. Um, due to time constraints, I've only been able to show you some of his adventures. This is around about two-thirds of his adventures. There's another page and a half I could show you about what he's done as well. But in the meantime, he's also an accomplished artist with more than 3,000 works of art in museums and art galleries all around the world. And most of these artworks relate to his adventures. Uh, he's the youngest person to be admitted to the USSR uh, Soviet Hall of Fame, and he's a gold medalist in the Russian Arts Academy. In 1998, he was um, inducted as a laureate into the United Nations Global 500. Now, these are the 500 most influential people in the world when it comes to protecting the environment. And when he was inducted, he joined people like Sir David Attenborough, um, Sir Edmund Hillary, Jacques Cousteau, uh, Jimmy Carter, Robert Redford, Jane Goodall, and uh, Greenpeace International in that very uh, austere group. But um, this is all about him crossing, becoming the very first person to row solo across the Pacific Ocean. And he left CONCON in Chile just before Christmas in 2013, and he was on his way to the coast. Now, at that very first meeting with Oscar on that Monday morning, I'd ask Oscar, when are you expecting your father? And he said, well, we really should expect him on, on Friday. And then um, the next day, he rang me and he said, uh, it's probably not going to be Friday anymore, it's probably going to be Saturday, you know, things are getting a bit tough out there. And then on the Wednesday he rang and he said, well, it won't be Saturday, it's going to be Sunday, it might even be Monday. And then on the Thursday he rang and said, it might still be Sunday, but more likely Monday now. And I thought, well, it doesn't really matter, everything's organised, it's all, you know, it's, it is what it is. And then on the Friday morning, early on the Friday morning, Oscar phoned me and he said, Jeff, it's going to be tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. I go, What? How did it go from Monday to Saturday? And he said that the, the winds had changed, he picked up some current, uh, he picked up a, he, 
his adrenaline was going because he was getting so close, so he was going to be there the next day. So once again, no problems, we've got everything organised. And um, so everything was organised. And we had done some media during the week, uh, not really knowing what sort of effect it was going to have, um, whether people were going to turn up or not. And that media was all about there's never going to be another first person to, land, to walk on the moon. There's never going to be another first person to uh, reach the South Pole. There's never going to be another first person to summit Everest. And there's never going to be another first person to row all the way across the Pacific Ocean. So if you want to be part of this, you've got to come down and, uh, and be there for it. And there was thousands of people uh, came down to the beach. And it was Saturday, the 31st of May, 2014. And as I said, the longest solo man-powered voyage in history, 1.31 million oar strokes on each oar. And you had a counter on the oars, so just an amazing sort of thing. And the plan was that um, he was going to come from out at sea, over here, from out at sea, and row around here, around this point here, and thousands of people were along these points here, and pull in at the beach over here. And the yacht club was just on the other side there and we could have a, a, uh, a press conference at the Yacht Club. So everything was pretty well organised for that. And we got down, I got down to the Yacht Club at 6.30 that Saturday morning, and I was surprised to see so many people because of the media we'd done. But I was also surprised to see how much media was there. There was a, about a dozen camera crews, there was two outside uh, broadcasting vans, there was two helicopters in the sky, um, and they wanted coordinates of where he was so they could go and take film. Um, there was uh, a lot of Russians wandering around in their national costume. They'd come from all over Australia and New Zealand. And a lot of them were carrying uh, cakes and, and loaves of bread, which were traditional gifts for their priest. And so it made for a very, very good atmosphere. And it was, I was quite busy for a while, because, sorting out the media. I put some of the media uh, camera crews onto an, another Coast Guard boat and sent them out to get some footage let the helicopters know where to go, all that sort of thing. And around about 8 o'clock in the morning, it all started to settle down and, and things were organised. And then Oscar phoned. And he was out in what we refer to as a tinny in Australia. So it's a four-metre aluminium boat, open boat, with an outboard on the back. And uh, he was out over near where his father was. Um, and the he said, the conditions have got a lot worse. It's not going to be 9 o'clock anymore. The winds have, have gone against him now. Um, so it's probably going to be more like 11 o'clock. And it didn't really matter. So then he rang a bit later and he said, it's probably not going to be 11 o'clock anymore, Jeff. It's going to be 1 o'clock. And then he said, it's probably not going to be 1 o'clock anymore, Jeff. It's going to be more like 4 o'clock. Or He's going to be there when he gets there, basically. And it really didn't matter because we were having a, a good time at the Yacht Club. Uh, it was all, all organised. There was a... a um, a radio station doing a live broadcast from there so we could let everyone, keep everyone informed about what was happening. And, uh, but um, just after lunch, we had our very first hiccup. And Oscar phoned and he said, Jeff, we've just learnt that um, your customs and immigration people are going to charge $1,100 to inspect the boat. We haven't got that in our budget. Can you help? And I thought, well... Customs and Immigration is federal government, I'm local government, I've really got no control. But anyway, I thought, I'll do what I can. And then a couple of minutes later, the Russian ambassador, who was a tall, gangly fellow, came storming across the yacht club with his arms wailing, and uh, he said, Jeff, I've just heard that your Customs and Immigration... And I said, yes, yes, you're, you're, eminent, you're Mr. Ambassador, I, I understand, uh, I'm working on it, just go and chill, have another coffee. Um, I'd made the mistake of putting a, a tab on the bar for VIPs to have coffee. And the Russian ambassador had taken full advantage of this. He was on his sixth double espresso by this stage. He was absolutely wired. I'm just glad he didn't have the nuclear launch codes with him at all. And um, so, but the customs immigration guy was there in his uniform. So I went over to him and I said, um, what's all this about? And he said, well, Malur Bar isn't a designated arrival port into Australia. So he's had to come up from Brisbane to do the processing. And because it was a Saturday, penalty rates applied. So instead of being $300, which would normally be, it was now going to be just over $1,100. And um, I said, oh, okay, right, okay. Um, what exactly are you looking for? And he said, you know, the usual fresh fruit and vegetables. <laughs> and I said, he's been at sea for 160 days. I mean, just how fresh do you think anything would be? 
And he said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, but I mean, I have to go through the process. And I said, okay, well, what happens if he doesn't pay? And he said, well, he'll still be able to come ashore as long as his passport's in order, um, but he won't be able to bring anything off the boat, and the boat will be confiscated. And I thought, oh, no. I mean, this had gone from a really good news story suddenly to a really bad news story. And I knew the media would concentrate on the negative aspect of it, you know, the boat being confiscated, rather than the achievement itself. So I thought something had to be done. And I thought, well, the next Russian tourist we ever get to the Sunshine Coast is going to be the 504th Parachute Regiment dropping in to get their boat back again. And uh, so I knew something had to be done, so I tried ringing some of my superiors at council, and uh, because it was a Saturday afternoon, no one was picking up their phone. So in the end, even though I didn't have the authority to do it, I made the decision that council would cover the $1,100 on the basis that we would try and uh, get it waived. And in the end, it was waived, which was good, because it meant I got to keep my job. Um, but in the minute, I'll show you a video, or I'll try and show you a video. Um, and it's, uh, in that video, you'll see the customs guy inspecting the, the boat, and uh, then Oscar holding up the passport with a big smile on his face. And that's what this is all about. So let's see if we can get this working. Both in the background, whale one, that's um, Steve Irwin's old boat. So this is the, the last three strokes of the one moving early strokes. Robert Duffy's in the background keeping people around. And he's arrived. And there's the customs guy on board uh, checking things out. And there's Oscar with the passport. So he's very, very happy. idea how we could view it after being at sea for 160 days. Just incredible. He always wears that purple hat. That's his signature, his signature thing. So his granddaughter. Grandson. That's Oscar's wife. So it was pretty exciting and a lot of fun, and we, we, so it was all good. And the plan was that um, Oscar and I had worked out a plan um, during the week where um, we would have a press conference and a ceremony back at the Yacht Club. And the plan was that um, uh, once he'd arrived, uh, we'd get um, Fedor to get back into the boat, and one of the, the rubber duckies would tow it around to the, through that breakwater and around the back of the, um, of the Yacht Club, and we'd have a ceremony there. And, uh, which was a great plan, except that we forgot to tell Fedor about it. And um, he didn't want to get back in the boat uh, that he'd been in for 160 days. So um, in the meantime, Lee and I had walked across the road to the Yacht Club, but we were having a, a celebratory glass of wine on the back deck. Um, and I was sitting out there, and I was waiting, looking out to make sure when the, the boat came to the, was towed around to the back of the Yacht Club. And um, someone came out, and he said, are you going to start the press conference? And I said, well, yeah, as soon as he gets here. And I was watching the boat come around, and I thought, that's Fedora in the boat. And this guy said, he's here. He's at the, at the bar having a cup of tea. And I said, what? And um, apparently, the, as I said, the plan had changed. As soon as we'd walked across the road, Fedora decided he didn't want to get back in the boat, so Oscar was going to take it around. Uh, and uh, Oscar had said to his dad, go across the road to the yacht club and ask for Jeff. And so his dad had come across the road. He'd missed the front entrance to the yacht club. He came into the side entrance where no one ever uses, and he'd walked up to the bar and he'd asked for tea. He doesn't speak English, he just said, tea, tea. And um, he, he said, yef, yef, and trying to find me. And they, the staff didn't have any idea who he was or what he was talking about. They made him a cup of tea. They thought he must be a tramp or something, the way he was dressed. And he didn't smell all that good either, I can tell you. And um, so he wasn't leaving the bar because he didn't have any currency to pay for this cup of tea that he'd, he'd just got. So we went inside and we, we saw him there and Lee went and got Oscar from the, the, the back of the yacht club and brought him up and we were introduced to Fedor for the very first time. And um, we went back down and we had this uh, ceremony down the back there where we presented him with a quintessential gift 
of the Sunshine Coast, which was a surfboard with a photo on there of where he arrived and an inscription about his, um, his, his journey across the Pacific Ocean. And in turn, he turned around, un, um, unknown to us, he turned around and he undid one of the oars, the carbon fibre oars that he'd rowed across the Pacific with. And he presented this to the people of the Sunshine Coast, which was a lovely gesture. Our mayor, who's the man on the, the right over here, he had been overseas on a junket, I mean, a, um, a trade mission um, at the time. And um, when he came back a couple of days later, he phoned me and he said, Jeff, I'd love to meet this guy. Can we set up a meeting? So once again, we were back at the yacht club. And I took the oar down with me and uh, Fedor autographed the oar and dated it. And it now has uh, pride of place in one of the council buildings on the coast. Um, but when we were there, uh, Oscar turned to the mayor and he said, is it possible to get a plaque uh, put uh, near where we landed to commemorate this event. And if you do, we'll come back in 12 months' time to do the unveiling of it. And the mayor turned to me and he said, I think that's a great idea, which is international code for Jeff, you get it organised. And um, so 12 months later, they were back on the coast um, to unveil this plaque, which is uh, on the pathway near where he landed. And um, each day, hundreds of people jog or walk or cycle past this plaque, which was, was great. But while they were back on the coast to unveil the plaque, the three of us were having coffee one day. And just to have a conversation, just to start the conversation and not meaning anything by it, I said, um, so what's the next big adventure? And they looked at each other and smiled. Now, when he stepped ashore at Malula Bar 12 months before, after crossing the Pacific, he had never set foot in a hot air balloon. 12 months later, he had his pilot's license for a hot air balloon and he planned to circumnavigate the world in a hot air balloon, trying to break the great American Steve Fawcett's world record for doing so. Richard Branson had tried this several times and failed. Steve Fawcett had tried six times before he was successful. But um, Fedor took off on his very first attempt from northern and western Australia on the 12th of July, 2016. He circumnavigated the world in this balloon and uh, broke Steve Fawcett's world record uh, by more than two days, creating yeah, a new world record. But then a couple of weeks later, he took another hot air balloon into the stratosphere, into space, 21 mile kilometers straight up into, into space, uh, setting a new record. And then a few days later, he and a co-pilot took another hot air balloon once again into the stratosphere, and uh, they set a new world record for time spent in space in a non-mechanical spacecraft. So that was. 55 hours, so a remarkable um, accomplishment. He was uh, awarded the Order of Honour in December 2017 by President Vladimir Putin, and during this ceremony, he also received a, um, a ballot paper and had a vote card for the next US presidential elections, which <laughs> would come in really handy. Just joking. Um, and then, about just over two years ago, um, I got a phone call from Oscar, and he said, Jeff, are you and Leanne in England? And I said, no, we're in Cyprus. Why? What's up? And he said, well, well Fedora and I are going to go to England to inspect progress on the new boat. It would be great to catch up. And I said, hang on, back up, back up. What new boat? And he was having a new boat built in England um, by this boat, same boat builder in England with the plan to row all the way around the world. And, um, he was going to do it all in one leg, but because of things that are coming up in the future, he had to change it to three, three stages. So last year in February uh, 2019, he took off from Port Chalmers or near Dunedin in New Zealand, and he rode all the way uh, to Cape Horn at the bottom of South America. And we kept track of him every day as he rode across uh, along there. We were actually part of that journey. We were on a cruise ship coming the other way, and we would stand on the port bow looking out to sea, thinking, okay, Fedor is 2,000 miles down that way somewhere. And this was an horrendous journey. I mean, he got slammed by all these storms. Not one, not two, but three cyclones hit him during this, this journey across the, um, the Pacific. And some days when we looked at the track, he'd been blown backwards for 40 kilometres. Now, during this journey, he reached the pole of inaccessibility for the, Pacific, for the Southern Hemisphere, which is a point in the Pacific Ocean which is further than any... That, far away from um, civilization or any sort of support than you, you could possibly be. And each day, 
The closest people to him were the, the cosmonauts and the astronauts circling overhead in the International Space Station. They were the closest people to him. Um, now, on that, that third cyclone that I told you about, it was, the storm was so severe that he had to strap himself into using four sets of straps into his uh, bunk on the, um, on the boat. Uh, he what, didn't have any food or water for those three days. He got tossed around, and he said it was like being uh, a cork in a washing machine. The boat was just flipped all ways around. And after three days, when the storm subsided, he found that a lot of the solar panels, these, um, these solar panels here are missing. You can see some at the front there. But these solar panels on the, on the back of the boat had been ripped off by the ferocity of that storm. They'd been glued down, and they'd also been screwed down, but that was no match for the storm. And that was a bit of a problem because um, these solar panels powered batteries which um, be used for his navigational and his communications equipment, but also for a small desalination unit that uh, converted fresh uh, seawater into fresh water. So he had to ration um, the fresh water for the rest of that journey. But he made it after 160 days, so, and he's going to start the next leg later on this year. And then um, about... November last year, so four months ago, uh, I got a phone call from Oscar, and he said, Jeff, are you and Leanne in England? And I said, yes, we are. And he said, I said, why? And he said, well, uh, we're going to Bristol to check on progress of the new balloon. It would be great to catch up. I said, hang on, back up, back up. What new balloon? And he was getting a new balloon made by Cameron Balloons in Bristol, um, which is going to be the world's largest hot air balloon. Uh, by the way, that's a sample, that's a bit of an offcut from the... Um, that balloon he used to circumnavigate the world with that record. And these are offcuts of this balloon he's going to um, uh, set this new record in. And uh, Lee said, I probably shouldn't have cut them off, but, you know. Um, she said it might be important, might be vital to the integrity of the balloon, but, you know, we'll soon find out. Um, this, as I said, the biggest balloon ever built. Eight and a half kilometres of fabric used in this balloon, minus a little bit. Um, and he plans to take off from northern and western Australia. He was supposed to do it next month um, and try and set another new record for um, going into space. So he was going to go 25 kilometres into space this time. Uh, an Indian fellow has broken his world record of 21. He wants that record back. So he's going to go 25 kilometres into space. As I said, he was going to do it uh, from northern next month, but because of the coronavirus, he's had to delay that till September. Bloody coronavirus. It's, uh, who would have thought something from China would last this long? Um, <laughs> so this is us at um, Cameron Balloons in, um, in uh, Bristol. Uh, and this is the capsule he's going to use to, for this attempt. And it's just a, a big steel capsule. But inside, it's very, very basic. There's not many instruments at all. There's just one seat that he gets strapped into um, to open the blowers up above. All there is is a bicycle chain, and he turns the, uh, a handle, the bicycle chain goes around and opens up the blowers or closes the blowers, whatever it's going to be. And he's had to go through cosmonaut training in uh, the cosmonaut centre in Russia to, uh, to do this attempt. Now, while we're... This is Don Cameron, who at 78 um, is the godfather of balloon manufacturing around the world. And we're in this little office of, at uh, Cameron Balloons, and... Um, Don was having a chat and he said at one stage, you know, I think I can um, build a balloon that can stay aloft for 20 days. You could circumnavigate the world twice. No one's ever done that before. And once Oscar translated that to Fedor, they looked at each other and smiled. So keep your eye out for, for that in the future. But while we were there, they also told us about another project where that boat builder in England is building a solar-powered catamaran. And he intends to sail, uh, cruise that around the world just based solely on solar power to highlight the uh, plastics uh, within the oceans that we've got, the problem we've got at the moment with that. But the other thing he was telling us about, and this is the most ambitious project that he has ever embarked upon, and it's the Albatross project. And he wants to become the very first person to fly a solo, uh, non-stop journey around the world based solely on, on solar power. A couple of years ago, he started doing gliding lessons, and we didn't understand why he was doing gliding lessons. Is he going to try and set a world record with a glider? But this, this plane is so light. Um, it's carbon fibre again, very, very light. It's got the heaviest thing on it are the flexible solar panels. And he wants to travel 37,000 kilometres around the world 
uh, taking between 180 and 190 hours to do it. And he intends to embark on that either late this year or early next year. So, and if he's successful, he'll put him up with people like um, uh, Charles Lindbergh or Charles Kingford Smith as one of the great uh, aviation pioneers. So, something to look forward to in the future. Now, people ask, why does he do this? Why? Uh, is it fame? Well, it can't be because no one here has ever heard of him. Uh, and I've done this I've talk on a dozen cruise ships and no one, not one person, has ever heard of him, uh, apart from Russian staff aboard the ship. Is it fortune? Well, no, he lives a very, very humble life. Uh, all of these adventures are sponsored and they've got to account for, for every cent that's spent. If you ask him, he'll say that it's because of the challenge. He loves the challenge of doing this. Um, he thinks it bring, brings honour to his family, to his country, and to his God. Um, so, once again, while we were at Cameron Bloons uh, a f four months ago, um, the four of us went across the road and had lunch. And uh, we were sitting there having coffee after lunch, and Oscar cleared his throat, and <clears throat> he said, Jeff, we want to talk to you about another project. And I said, another one? I mean, what else could there be? I mean, we've got all these projects. And he said, well, no, not for us, for you. And he said, we'd like you to write uh, Fedor's biography. We want uh, him to inspire people in the West. And um, I was a bit surprised. I said, I've never written a book. And he said, we know that. Um, but you know us, we know you, we think you're the best person to do it. So that's my project at the moment. I'm, I'm working on a, a book about um, all his adventures. And so hopefully down the track when we see each other on the high seas again, assuming we ever get off this one, um, I'll be able to autograph copies of the New York Times bestseller for you. Uh, about to <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you think that this man is the world's greatest living adventurer, um, but I'm very, very proud to call both of them uh, my friends. And that's the story of Fedor Konjakov, the world's greatest living adventurer. I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you've learned something by it. Uh, if you see us around the ship, don't hesitate to come and say good day. So thank you. Thank you.